Hello, good evening, and welcome to On Number Three. This week, we pick up from where we left off last week, where we were stopped at Numbers 14, verse 26, and uh, we'll be continuing and finalizing the journey. All right, so I'm just going to share the last part of last week's episode with you. So let me just share my screen right now. Um, Chrome tab. Oh, I always forget to click share audio. Because you see, and it's not, it's okay to remind God of his word. Not that him forgetting, I was said, Lord, remember you said. Remember you said, remember your word says, you know, people mock me because I'm having faith in God for something he promised me, a vehicle, and the people mock me. Don't me I deal with them, but me still I believe God because these people will never enter the land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I perform, both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. No, ask yourself. How many times have you been disobedient? You want to go around the wilderness again and again and again, never coming into the promise because every time you reach that point, you are scared and you don't do what the Lord tells you to do. You're afraid to take that step. Listen, there's a thing called a leap of faith. And there's a there's a um a movie. Indiana Jones movie, I think it's the last, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there's a point when he is at the cliff. He can't turn back. And there's a chasm across to where he has to go. And he listens to the riddle. And he realizes he has to take a leap of faith. Now, as far as he can see, there is nothing there. But he takes the leap of faith, and what he ends up on is a bridge that takes him across the chasm. But from where he stood, he couldn't see it. But the camera angle gave us a different perspective. Sometimes you have to ask the Lord, show me a different perspective. Why am I not seeing what you have Look said? On the question, because yeah. I know it must be there because you said it. So Lord, change my perspective. When you do that, then you're able to see the thing that he has promised you. You're able to see it with his eyes. Ask him to give you his eyes, give you the heavenly vision that you can see it from his point of view. Now, he says, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him to, into the land he explored, and his descendants will possess their full share of the land. Now turn around. Don't go toward the land where the Amalekites and Canaanites live. Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. All right. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to end here. But next week on number three, we shall pick up at verse 26 where we left off. And that will be the final part of the journey series. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'm I was muted there for a minute. Now we pick up from Numbers 14, verse 26, and we'll continue the journey series. 
So in verse 26, the last thing we heard, okay, was that they must not bother go into the promised land. <laughs> they must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. And then <clears throat> verse 26 says, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints against me? Yes, I've heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things you say. You will all drop dead in this wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years or older and was included in the registration will die. Now, if you, if you look back in numbers, the registration refers to the census that was taken of all the men over 20. So you will not enter or occupy the land I swore to give to, give to you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. All right. Now, in Job, you know, in the book of Job, there is a verse that says, the very thing I fear has come upon me. And a lot of times the things we fear that come upon us is the things we declare out of our own mouth. So in verse 31, it says, you said your children will be carried off as plunder. Well, I will bring them safely into the land and they will enjoy what you despise. But as for you, you will drop dead in this wilderness. No, people, when God gives you a promise, it is really for you and your generations, you know. So when you forsake the promise of God by walking in disobedience and, and being afraid and giving into fear, you will not enjoy what God has promised you. Even though you have seen many miracles and you have seen uh, all kinds of wonders that the Lord has wrought, when you refuse to enter into what God has promised you, you're, you're, based on this word, you're going to die not entering into it because you were afraid, because you did not have a godly perspective of yourself. You looked at what you thought the world said about you, when in truth and in fact, even if you remember from last week's, um, from last week's teaching, that the people that they thought saw them as grasshoppers and according to them because they can read minds and say they think so too or the very people who the Rahab said to them our hearts melted because of what we hear God do for you listen there are people who the enemy has set up to work against you but the fear of God is upon them because they hear of what God has done for you but if you are not looking at these people with a godly perspective you're not looking from seated beside Jesus as a co-heir with him. If you are not looking from that perspective, they will look like giants. So I'm going to give you an example. I said to a friend of mine who has a business, I said, if I wanted to see the national stadium from here, what would I have to do? And he said, well, you'd have to go to the gate, turn right, turn left, and you'll be able to see a part of the stadium. So I said, what if I went up on the roof? He said, oh, you could see the stadium and more. You need to get that elevated view. You need to get the eagle eye vision, the view from up top here, not the view from down here. Because if you are lying on the ground and you're looking, your horizon will be at ground level. If you stand, your horizon will be at the height that you are, that's, the, that's your eye level. But if you look from a spiritually elevated perspective, from being seated beside Jesus Christ, Listen to me, man. You cannot help but have the heavenly perspective. So what people say about you won't matter. What people say about why you can't do this. Why, when your parents tell you, oh, you can't do this because I tried it and it didn't work. You can say, but that was you. I am going to try it now and it must work because God says, this is what he has in store for me. God says, this was my inheritance. You did not walk into it, but I am sure going to walk into it. You have to be certain of what God is telling you. So 
he said, God is saying to them in verse 31, he said, you said your children would be carried off as plunder. Well, I will bring them safely into the land and they will enjoy what you have despised. Because when you don't walk into the promise of God, you are despising what God has promised to you. You hear? When you don't walk into what God has promised you, you have despised what God has promised you. You're telling him that he can't do it. You're telling him that the odds and the circumstances are greater than him. And when you're telling him that, you're telling him, God, really and truly, how oh, am I going to faith in you if you do this? I miss a giant. Yeah, you see, giant. Remember David? David and Goliath, when everybody was there quaking, what did, what did David, the covenant boy, say? But how dare this uncircumcised? Because he must say, but if I'm not covenant with God, I have covenant with God. That's what the circumcision was about. The circumcision was a blood covenant with the men of Israel and God. And he said, but this uncircumcised Philistine who don't have no relationship with God, who don't have no covenant with God, going to come defy the armies of the living God, the God where me have a covenant with. David took up five stones. A lot of people like to symbolize and say five, the number of grace. But really, Goliath had four other brothers. Our brothers and sons, I can't remember. But four other relatives. And if they plan to take out the whole of them. That's it. Plain and simple. Could be the only reason why I would have taken out five stones. Because I sure him never planned to miss. I sure him never planned to miss. And when hit him, right smacking him for it. Bring him down to ground level and cut off him head. That's what you must do with your enemies. Not physically. Okay. Let me say that very clearly. But you must be prepared to cut off the spirit behind them, chop it up and throw it away. Okay? Because <laughs> how dear an uncircumcised Philistine dare to defy the armies. Wait, them not say who I'm with. There's more here for me than who is against me. Hello? You could bring your armies, but the armies of the angel, the, the, the heavenly host is here with me. This a man shout a hallelujah, right? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! So when he's talking to them now, because they're out to receive a punishment that they didn't need to receive. It's 11 days journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, where they're to cross. And it, now because of disobedience and because of, of fear, and giving in to fear, it's, as I say, it's okay to experience fear, but it's a different thing when you come into agreement with fear. Because when you come into agreement with fear, you're going to say, God is not as great as what I am fearing. Okay? If you look in Psalm 57, which I covered in Monday night in the Psalms, you will see there's a part where David says, Listen, I am overwhelmed with frantic fear. But then he said, But, but look here, the very trap my enemy set for me, it's working against them. Right? And this was when he was in the cave hiding from Saul. And look where God put Saul, right in the cave. Saul go use the bathroom in the cave where David a hide. And David could have just killed him right there. So and that's another thing to you know. God test your heart when he puts your enemies in front of you. Okay, Cam could have murdered him and he would feel justified. But he said, No, this is the Lord anointed. I can't raise my hand against him. Right? Your heart position is very, very important. So God said, but as for you, you who are defying me, you who are disobedient, you're going to drop dead in this wilderness. Do you want to drop dead in the wilderness? Listen, the wilderness experience tough in it, tough enough as it is without you having to go face the specter of death. You're going to dead yourself. You're going to die here for those who speak proper English. But I'm Jamaican, so let me tell you, you're going to dead yourself. That's basically what God tell them. And he says, and your children will be like shepherds wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. This is what you bring for your picnic now. Because you're not walking at your promise. You'll make your picnic walk for 40 years in a wilderness experience. In this way, they will pay for your faithlessness until the last of you dies in the wilderness. Well, we thank God for Jesus. Because he say. As a, as of, I think it's from in Isaiah, he said, no longer will the children's teeth be set on edge because the fathers eat sour grapes. So thank you, Jesus. Me now go suffer because my forebears refuse to walk in your promise. We thank you that I'm not going to go through this wilderness for 40 years. I can walk into my inheritance because I am now in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
But let's continue. Verse 34. Because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sin. Again, I said, thank you, Jesus, because you bear the curse on the cross for me. Then you will discover what it's like to have me as an enemy. Now, listen to me. That is one discovery I don't want. I don't want to know God as an enemy. I'd rather he be my friend, my companion, my father, the lover of my soul, but I don't ever want to know God as an enemy. And even then, David said when he was faced with the choices of being pursued by men or falling into the hands of God, what himself better me fall into the hands of God than to fall into the hands of man. But I don't want to know God as an enemy. I don't want to discover what it's like to be God's enemy. I was his enemy before I accepted Jesus Christ. And that season of my life never did cute. Right? It wasn't pretty. So... But even while I was his enemy, he still went to the cross for me, sent his son to the cross for me, even while I was his enemy. So him love for me not change, you know, even though I'm his, I'm his enemy. But to access, oh, hallelujah, to access the forgiveness and the redemption and the restoration, I had to come to a place where I accepted his son as my Lord and Savior and all that he represented. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have spoken. I will certainly do these things to every member of the community who has conspired against me. They will be destroyed here in the wilderness and here they will die. The 10 men Moses had sent to explore the land, the one who, is, who incited rebellion against the Lord in their bad report, were struck dead with a plague before the Lord. Listen to me. I think a big problem with the world, what me go say Jamaica, is that there's no fear of the Lord anymore. <clears throat> the Lord is common to them. Okay. So nobody no fear God. Everybody trusts in them obia and them witchcraft and the gathering and the whatever and they commit all kind of evil. But he who keepeth Jamaica neither slumber nor sleep. Okay, a day of reckoning is coming. Just like how these men had a reckoning. Hallelujah. They had a reckoning right there. Their accounts were balanced and they were dropped dead right there. So. Because they incited rebellion against the Lord. Listen to who listening to this. If you're inciting rebellion against the Lord, take this as a warning. A day of reckoning is coming. Okay, I didn't plan to go there, so, but since the Holy Ghost carried me there. So let it be. So, of the 12 who had explored, explored the land, only Joshua and Caleb remained alive. Let's go back and look at those two. So they reported, this is in chapter 13. It says, when they were there moaning and groaning, they entered the land, they said, how good the land, remember now the kind of fruit it produced, you know that. One we say in Jamaica, one dege dege, but one bunch of grapes required two men to carry it on a pole. Hello. And you don't like them grapes, little, don't it? Yeah, man. Me, I don't think I could get enough of those grapes. And this is a land so fortified, so beautiful, so rich, it says. It is indeed a bountiful con country. I'm looking at chapter 13, numbers 13, verse 27. And then they went with the bot. The bot. You know, bot always bother me, you know. When people go, I like you, you know, bot. I go, oh boy. They can't just like me. <laughs> you know, you have to have a bot in there. All right, what's the bot? But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We saw giants there, even the descendants of Anak, and they went through all the ites and vites who lived there. But Caleb, in verse 30, Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses and said, let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. So they gave a good report, because them know, them know, say, God not taking them there to kill them. So if giants in the land, God must plan to take them out. Hello, I'm not going to leave them there to persecute them. Listen to me. If God has told you to do something that will enable you to walk into a promise, believe me, 
no obstruction that you see before you is bigger than God. I'm not saying you're not to notice what is there, you know, because it will help you to navigate. But you're not to become fearful of the mountain that you see before you. You do like Zachariah and you say, who are you, great mountain, to stand before me? Be thou made as a plain. And guess what? It has to happen because you have spoken it with the authority that God has given you over the earth. All right, let's go. So if we look at verses 39, we'll pick up there. When Moses reported the Lord's words to all the Israelites, the people were filled with grief. No. <laughs> I have to laugh here, you know, because this is always a constant state of Israel. And sadly, a constant state of a lot of us. So you defy God. He tell you what I'm going to do. You start to mourn and groan. You know, believe say, a consequence would come of your action. Hello. So what they do, they get up early the next morning, verse 40, and went to the top of the range of the hills and said, let's go. They said, no, <laughs> we're back to disobedience again, you know, because well, let's go back to verse 25, 24. He said, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others had. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. Verse 25, now turn around. And do not go on toward where the Amalekites and Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the sea. Whoa, let's jump back down to verse 40. <laughs> it would have to be verse 40. Then they got up early the next morning and went to the top of the range of hill. Let's go, they said. We realize we have sinned, but now we are ready to enter the Lord, the Lord, the land the Lord promised us. Hello. God, now just tell him to go back. God not just tell them, don't go. But what them you? No, man. All right, God, me sorry. So guess what? Never go now, right? After God tell them. That should have happened a long time. God, God make him command already. And Moses said, but why are you disobeying the Lord's orders to return to the wilderness? It won't work. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> You're disobeying the Lord. It's not going to work. Okay, he said, do not go up into the land. You will only be crushed by your enemies because the Lord is not with you. When you disobey the Lord, he is not with you. All right. He says, when you face the Amalekites and the Canaanites in battle, you will be slaughtered. The Lord will abandon you because you have abandoned the Lord. But the people defiantly pushed ahead towards the hill country. Even though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in those hills came down and attacked them and chased them back as far as Horma. <laughs> Listen to me. Verse chapter 15 is about what they are to do when they come into the promised land and so on. So I'm not going into that. So I'm going to look for uh, Deuteronomy. What was it about Deuteronomy that I wanted to show you? All right. Oh, in Deuteronomy, I, I don't find the scripture yet, but the Lord just bring it to me. Basically, the Lord, let's say everybody they don't know. And it's time to cross over. Okay. And the Lord tells them. That how they are to cross over. I don't want you to, to look at something for me. I, and I'll cover this more in the next series. In the next lesson. Which is the seven enemies of your success. Is that. Um, if I remember. If I find the scripture. I will put it in. I will find the scripture. I'll put it in the description. So you can follow up on it. But basically, the Lord tells them how to um, how they're going to cross the Jordan River. And I want you to consider the children, the children of Israel who are crossing the Jordan River. Remember, they didn't see the Red Sea party. They only hear about it. 
So they are to experience this for themselves. Listen, nothing like your own testimony. Okay, nothing like your own testimony. So, okay, they hear about that God parted the Red Sea and all right, I don't want to say my parents lying, but you know, that is really a lot to take in God parting the Red Sea. I've never seen that. So they're at the Jordan, which has overflowed its bank. It's that time of the year when the Jordan overflows its banks and they have to cross. And so as the priests put their foot in the water, the water dried. So they didn't just cross on a parted Jordan River. They crossed on dry ground. So when it's time for you to take up your land and you see a flood water in front of you, God will make you cross upon dry ground. You ain't going to slug in no mud to get to the other side. You hear me? I declare that over you today. You are not going to slug in mud to get to the other side. But here's something else about the Jordan River. The Jordan River at that point, according to some literature that I read some years ago, comes down off of a mountain. And not only did they cross over on dry land, but the water stopped in mid-air. Hello. So they get miracle upon top of miracle, double portion. Mir Listen, I declare the double portion miracle over you today in the name of Jesus. I declare it over you today. The double portion miracle. You shall not only cross on dry ground, you shall never slug in mud to get to the other side, to get to your breakthrough, but there shall be no flood waters coming down upon you. Hallelujah. The Lord will give you a double portion miracle to get to the other side. May I receive it for myself? You don't know about to know, but me, I take that for myself. But I want you to, I'm going to close off now and I'm going to talk to you about Rahab. Remember, we touched on it um, last week in the book of Joshua 3, I think it was. Joshua 2, verses 8 to 12, where Rahab was saying, we are, we were scared of you. We hear what the Lord do in Egypt. We hear what happened to Agan Sihon. We hear what happened to the Amalekites. Trust me, God, make sure them get the news of what I am doing for my, <laughs> listen, Lord. The Lord is going to send news ahead of you of what he is doing for you. Hallelujah. So they are, Saying so, I want you to put yourself for for a moment in the in the place of the, the 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 people who live in Jericho. Okay, so you are hearing about this multitude of people. Remember, six hundred and odd thousand men and their families. I remember them time that I was having one and two picnic. Right, they were having only for children. Right, so they are hearing. Eventually, now they are seeing these people on the plains of Jordan, literally blotting out the horizon. Because do you think your eyes can really take in 600 or odd thousand people and their family all at once? You have to do like what we call in, in, in photography, do like a split thing. So you, you take this panel and you take this panel and you take this panel and you stitch it together to get a panoramic view. But from where they were in the towers of Jericho, they could see this multitude of people approaching them. They are fearful. Their heart melts because they're hearing not, this is not just the people that bother in them, you know, it's not the multitude of people that bother in them. It's the, <laughs> it's the God that's going before them. Is the God that walking behind them to protect them of a cloud of fire between them and them enemies? Is a God that have is going ahead of them to make crooked paths straight? And I say to you, as you are going forward, people are going to wonder how it's so easy, and they don't know. They won't know the God you serve now because the gods I serve don't go ahead of me and make no crooked paths straight for me. But I say, how you do this so easy? How you come across this? How, how did you come up with this idea so easily? How are you so, it's so easy for you to strategize because the God you serve is going ahead of you to make it easy for you, right? In making it easy to walk the path, you just have to walk in obedience. You just have to pay attention to what he's saying because although the path may look crooked to the natural eye, he will show you where you must put your foot. So that you don't walk into a trap. Hallelujah. 
So these people know, they go, all right, maybe they have a season to prepare because the Jordan River is swollen. There is no way that they can cross this. So we have a little season to prepare. So make we go and wait. Lo and behold, what them say? River part and people across upon dry land. Imagine what happened to them if them heart didn't melt. When they hear about you, you know, when them see it now, it's a totally different experience because hearing about something and seeing something, <laughs> whoa, you know. So they are there watching these Israelites cross. Firstly, you can, I, I'm just in awe of God, you know, because I'm, I'm just picturing these people on the wall, watching the river churn. I say, what go on yourself? And churn and churn and then it part. And then go, oh, it probably muddy them can't. And then we see people cross like it's dry land. <laughs> and then go, hold on, dear. This is the God we are here about. No, we've seen it, right? Then to make matters worse, no, the, the waterfall that's coming out, stopping mid-air. And I'm like, all right. I never seen anything like that before. You know, <laughs> this is really freaking me out here. Hello. You know, or in, if we're going to put it in King James, this freaks me out, you know. <laughs> But the point of the matter is they are now seeing the power of the God you serve at work for you. Hello. I don't know much. About, I'm really excited about this because me no say in a few days, people are going to see the power of God working for me. Hallelujah. Make that declaration. In a few days, in a few days, hence tomorrow, people shall see the power of God working for me. Hallelujah. And so, they say everybody come camp on their side of the river now. So everybody kind of uneasy. So the, the spies go out. You can read this in Joshua 2, 3, and 4. The spies go out and they, they meet up with Rahab. Rahab hide them. The king hear about them, but she send the king wide. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord, for my friend in the enemy camp that's going to send my enemy wide. Yeah, man. Send the king wide. I said, they're gone, you know. they got. And I'm like, which man? You know, I'm a whore. Hello. Hold up, man, come here. So, how am I going to know which man? Oh, them two, they, oh, them gone a long time. So, you know, it's a business me run. So, whatever I linger for. So, them gone that way, go check them that way there. And all that time, she have them hide from her roof. But she said, listen, no. Me, no, I'm going to go on, you know. So, here's the thing. So, when, when you start things out, Save my family. That's all I ask. Me not go talk your business. Me not go tell nobody. Save your save my family. And them say get all your family in one place and put the red the red sash there. So we will know, say. Me tell my soldier them, listen, no trouble this so. All right. You see the blood of Jesus. <laughs> oh let me tell you something, man. That mark of the blood of Jesus on you means that you are untouchable. By the enemy. Hello. You can try because the, web, the scripture says no weapon form. So weapons are going to be formed, but it can't come near you. Don't worry about it. Okay. I got him name. And so let's take the day of the attack. So you want to picture the scene like an arena. Everybody lean up against the wall. And the Israelites come and they march around. Nobody does say nothing. Gone at them. Yeah, they go, wait. A puppy show thing this, right? The second, you know, I imagine the first day, they're like bemused, you know, wondering what the heck is going on, you know. Maybe one or two people are saying, this art, very freakish, right? But next day, everybody come out for the show again. Israelites march around, not a word. As I was saying, not a word in English, but really not a word in Hebrew. And them gone again. And this happened for six days. So I can imagine that by the sixth day, everybody want to hurry up and eat them breakfast. I run, come out to see the spectacle because them Israelites said, must be idiot. What am I doing this for? So, you know, the seventh day, quite a few people should have been leaning on that wall, looking out. Yeah, man. So between the weight of them against the wall, the thunder of sound in the heavens, possible earthquake that followed, everything come crashing down. Nobody have no time to laugh no more. Nobody are dead. This is the God you serve, people. He is greater than any enemy. He is greater than any circumstance. I hope you enjoyed this series of the journey. I'm going to 
just play a video of a promotion we have upcoming and then we'll pray and next time we do on the tree next week we'll be talking about the seven enemies of your success and they are mentioned in joshua 1 and i think it's verses 1 to 9 or 1 to 10 so we'll be covering that in that episode and then we'll be moving on to other things so let's just listen to this pay attention to this video and then when we come back we will pray All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of mercy, a God of love and long suffering, Father. Father, we come before you tonight, repenting of the many times we have disobeyed you and not walked into our promise. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for that, Lord. You are able to forgive us and willing to forgive us when we confess our sins and turn from them and you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, Father, for every act of disobedience that we have done regarding your promise to us, Lord, every time that we have despised your promise, every time, Lord, that we have rebelled against what you have told us, Father, we, we repent and we turn away from it, Lord. And we say, Lord, we are willing and ready to be obedient and to walk into that which you have caused us to walk into. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that, Lord, you just love us so much that you're willing to go ahead of us and you're willing to send word to our enemies of what you do for us and what you can do on our behalf. And so, Father, we just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Before I go, it just hit me. In Deuteronomy, there is a verse that says, I'll put this, this scripture reference in the description. There's a verse that says, you have gone around this mountain long enough, now turn north. And so this is the end of the 40 years. And the Lord said to Moses, tell the people, they've gone around the mountain long enough, turn north. And when I looked up what north meant, actually north meant um, gloomy and fearful. What It was fear that caused the Israelites not to walk into their promise. But to walk into that promise, you still have to face the fear that you had run away from. So turning north means turn back and face what had made you fearful. But this time you're going to turn around and make what made you face what made you fearful and face it and go up against it because you now have a different different perspective of the God you serve. And without further ado, I bid you a blessed night and see you next week on the tree.